Well, hello, everybody. Great to be with you. My name is Alex Grum, and I'm the campus pastor for our Torrance location. And this is the time in our service where we are live connected with our Torrance crew. Great to be with you guys. Thanks for coming to church at Torrance. Uh, I love you the most. Uh, way better. Just kidding. Just kidding. Everyone, we're all at church here, several locations. If you're here at Manhattan Beach Live, thank you for being here. Great to see your faces. And then if you're watching this online throughout the week, uh, that is so awesome. Thanks for doing that. I'm just thrilled every week that we can be one church in so many different spots. Uh, today, uh, we are finishing up our series called Backstory 2, which is, of course, the sequel to Backstory 1, which is a series we did last year. Both of these series have been about looking at themes from the Old Testament part of the Bible to help us better understand who God is and especially better help us connect with Jesus, who shows up in the New Testament. Um, We've tackled some big topics over the past three weeks already. Let me just point those out, so go through what they were. We started with talking about Sabbath and what that means in our lives, then covenants the second week, and then last week we looked at this big word, atonement. These are heavy topics, uh, and I'm really happy with how these have been received fo- so far. Actually, thinking about how heavy they were uh, reminded me of my my personal favorite part of this series, which might seem odd, because it's this guy in the branding. Have you? I mean, he's been staring us in the face the whole time, but have you seen him? Where this, this is actually an illustration uh, of of uh, an 18 from the 1800s. A, a, German artist made this illustration, and it is of Jesus teaching the scribes, teaching the scholars. Now, this is supposed to be 12-year-old Jesus, Um, so I don't think the artist had ever seen a 12-year-old before in their lives, because this is obviously a full-grown, bearded-looking Jesus, Uh, but uh, this comes from the story of Jesus teaching the temple scholars uh, from the Old Testament, so a perfect fit for our series, of course. But I just love this guy with his head and his hands. He cannot handle. This is some deep stuff for him. He's overwhelmed. Uh, Maybe you felt like that. But I would say I have felt just the opposite. There have been some great conversations and questions asked and discussions that have happened out of the series. So thank you. When we we dive into this, uh, chew on some deep stuff, thanks for rising to the occasion. Uh, I hope it's been a good catalyst for good conversations in your families or in your life groups. Uh, We're going to finish up this series, this fourth week, uh, by talking about this part of the Old Testament, the prophets. The prophets were men and women of God in the Old Testament period who were charged by God to bring his truth to his family, his people, the people of Israel. We're going to explore some of those themes together. I like talking about the prophets uh, because it is a chance for me. I've shared this once before. I have dabbled in a little bit of prophecy myself, consider myself a little bit of an amateur prophet, uh, but my uh, predictive abilities have been very uh, scant in my life, and they're always around a really ridiculous and unhelpful theme, which is, for some reason, I have been able to uh, predict the death of celebrities with my feelings, very unhelpful, but let me, let me show, tell you a story about when this has happened and how the theme began. Uh, have you heard of this guy? Uh, this is uh, a comic, Rodney Dangerfield. Uh, uh, if, he was a funny guy. He was in a lot of movies when I was a kid. Uh, a lot of people liked him in the 70s, 80s, that kind of range. Uh, if you have never heard of him, that's okay. You just need to know that he's a comedian and he exists or rather that he existed, which is part of the story here. Um, About 20 years ago, I was a young youth pastor, and one of the students I was working with in our high school group was a tennis player and invited me to come watch his tennis match, and so I did. And I'm sitting out there in this afternoon uh, with other parents uh, watching their students play tennis when, I don't know why, but the parental conversation that was happening in that little group of parents and me was about people that they liked, celebrities that they were like, and Rodney Dangerfield, as an old comic, came up. And one of the parents said, huh, is he still alive? Is Rodney Dangerfield still alive? And at that tennis match, I said, hmm, I think he's dead. And I said, he feels dead to me. That was was were my words. We all went home, thought nothing of it. The next morning, I got in my car and turned on, like, the news radio, and it was like, Rodney Dangerfield died yesterday at the age of 84. I murdered Rodney Dangerfield (laughs) with my feelings. A very similar thing happened with Steve Jobs. Uh, And lately, I have been feeling weird about Clint Eastwood. So we'll just see what happens there. I just thought that'd be a very morbid thing to see. Oh, Lord, please help Clint Eastwood to survive. Listen, the reason I tell you about this is that Obviously, that was just a ridiculous fluke that just happened to happen. And I wish only the best to Clint Eastwood and his family. (laughs) May he live another hundred years. But um, 
I tell you that because some, that idea of predicting the future is usually what we in our culture think of first, of first when we think of what the word prophet or prophecies is referring to. We think of prophets as, you know, the image we have from science fiction or from fantasy where they, they have the, some, a magical ability to be an oracle or a magic crystal or something that they can see the future and they foretell what's going to happen. Uh, and even like, oh, there's a chosen one that's going to come. And th- th- that's the kind of image we have of predicting the future that is the exclusive realm of what we would term a prophet. I want to tell you that that's not the definition that the Bible uses for the prophets. It's much different looking in the Bible than just that. Now, that isn't to say that the prophets in the Old Testament didn't say things about the future. They often did and make predictions, especially around uh, what God was going to do in the future, and specifically that he was going to, from their time, it was the future, in the future, send the ultimate rescuer. The Messiah was going to come and make all things right and reconnect connect us to God despite our sin. Now, all of those future prophecies they made were fulfilled in Jesus when he showed up around the year zero. He fulfilled through his life hundreds of these prophecies. It's actually a major reason we believe he truly was the son of God, the ultimate Messiah sent to fulfill these prophecies. Uh, But despite them talking about the future, that was not their usual MO. That was not, certainly not the bulk of their career as prophets. Most of the time, their primary purpose was to bring God's truth to the immediate situation that God's people were living through. And even when they did talk about the future, it was intended to jar people in a way that would get them to change their actions, grow closer to God in the present moment. So prophets, I I was reading and studying this past couple weeks for this message, and One of the best uh, ways to describe them came from an author who said this. Prophets in the Old Testament were more forth-tellers. They brought forth the truth of God in that moment than they were foretellers or fortune-tellers. So they dabbled a little bit when God told them something about the future, but their emphasis was on the here and now. What does God want to say to his people right now? Now And hey, listen, that's what we all need. We all need to hear from God right now. In fact, let me just say, maybe you've been to a church service or some Christian event, and maybe there was a, a speaker, maybe it's me or Jason, or if you're a student, Ashley Deal often speaks at those things. Maybe, have you ever felt that moment where something is said or a Bible verse is read, and you're like, mm, are they talking to me directly? Did someone tell them about a problem I have in my life, and that's why he's preaching about this? First of all, no. Uh, that's not how it works. We don't spy on your lives and then be like, this one's for you, buddy. This one. I mean, that would be an interesting way to do a message where everyone you're like, maybe it's my turn to get talked about. Um, but let me on the flip side say that, yes, that is what's happening. Because God uses his Holy Spirit, his Bible, his word, his people to speak his immediate truth in real situations in our lives. So if you've ever felt that emotion or that feeling, maybe it was from reading something or hearing a message or from the words of a close Christian friend and you thought, boy, that truth was really what God wanted to say to me, you are experiencing the forth-telling echo, the continuation of what God was doing in his ancient prophets from the Old Testament. God is not done speaking words of prophecy in our lives through his Holy Spirit and his word and his people. We are participating in that anytime we look for truth in the Bible, whether that's at church or in your own personal lives. In fact, that's what was going on in the Old Testament so much that I think it would, this might be review for some of you, I'd actually like to look and just go overview of what the Old Testament looks like and where the prophets fall into that. We talk about the Bible being a book. It's different than any book you've ever read. We don't have much experience nowadays with ancient uh, literature like this, but the Bible isn't just one book. It's actually many books divided into the two main sections of the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament itself isn't even a book. It has 39 books inside of it, and each of these books is very different than any novel or book you might read today uh, because they're written in ancient times. These were all written between, let's say, 4,000 and 400 B.C. is around when these are talking about in history. Um, These are the 39... uh, Did some of you memorize these when you were a kid? I was at, like, a Christian camp once and had to memorize these, so I still... I could sing a little song. I won't, but I could sing a little song about them, which is an odd thing to have as a gift. Uh, But... 
let me show you that they're divided up really into four sections for our purposes. Let me show you what those are. The first one is this. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. This is called the Torah or uh, the, the, the books of the law. These are primary books for the Jewish faith. They talk about uh, the stories, the narratives from creation, the very beginnings of the world uh, up through many main characters. Some of the most famous Bible characters, Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and Moses, all have their uh, stories captured in these five books of the Bible. This was the time that God was establishing people and establishing his special relationship with the people of Israel who he chose as his special family. The goal was that the people of Israel would be so connected with God that everyone else in the world would be blessed by them and become part of the family of God. But after these five books of the Bible, there's another section, which is called the books of history. This is really ancient Jewish history. You can read in these sections about famous military leaders like Joshua or uh, famous kings like King David or King Solomon. These books are the history of how God's people, Israel, tried to have the right relationship with him through what we've talked about called covenants or promises. God promised to be their God. God promised that he would never leave them. God promised that they would, he would uphold them, always welcome them back if they would turn to him. And Israel over and over and over failed in their promise keeping. They were not faithful to God. They would have seasons where they were doing really good and then do something really terrible. They would, they would turn to foreign gods and idols and forget totally about God, and then God would bring them back. So that's the, that's the history. These are all so far narrative books, like in somewhat chronological order if you're reading it. But then there's a section of the Bible called poetry. These are like famous. The Psalms and Proverbs are in here. Uh, a lot of like, it's like the hymnal of the Bible. A lot of our even modern worship songs are inspired by these beautiful poems from the book of Psalms especially. After that, at the tail end of the Old Testament is... The prophets, and they're divided into the major and minor prophets, really just because these guys wrote long, and those guys, the minor prophets, have little tiny books. Um, Those prophets are all lumped together uh, for what God wants to say to his people. Now, the confusing point is that you could look at this and think that those all must have happened at the end of Israel's history, and that's just not the case at all. We organize our Bibles traditionally in this way, but really the things that those prophets were saying were they were saying to people within this history. Look, we've drawn some arrows about where these prophets really were speaking. They were not independently speaking at the end of time. They were speaking directly to situations going on in Israel's history. As the people of Israel stopped following God, turned away from him, God into that situation would send these prophets to speak his truth and have, try to get them to turn around, which they sometimes Sometimes did, not often. Let me just suggest something, by the way. If you have ever been a person who's like, I want to read through the Old Testament, it is really hard. You need to hear that, that if you've tried this and you're like, geez, it was really hard. Hey, I get it. We, that's true. If someone's like, reading the Bible's easy, they are wrong <laughs> or are reading it differently. Anyway, let me give you at least something that has helped me of if you want to tackle this challenge of reading the Old Testament. Um, because of the way that our normal Bibles are uh, written, you read this, the history and then you get to the prophets and it's long and it's slogging and it's difficult. There is a resource uh, that looks like this. There's many other ways called a chronological Bible. I don't know if you can see that from where you're sitting. Chronological Bibles basically reorder everything in chronological order to the best of their ability. I found that massively helpful. Chronological Bibles really are organized like this, where if you're in the middle of 1 Kings and there was a prophecy from Amos or whatever, Micah, that's, that's, it would put it right in the middle of that narrative to say this is the direct place where God was speaking this truth to his people. It's not required, but it, is, it was really helpful for me as I finally started to grasp what God was trying to say in the Old Testament. If you're up for the challenge, this would be a great tool to, uh, by yourself or with a group to go through the Old Testament with a chronological Bible. There is a benefit, though, of this kind of traditional Bible layout, which is when we do smush all of the prophets together and you read them all in one chunk, major themes are repeated over and over in a startling way. Uh, In fact, that's where we're going to get our main point from. The main point today is this. We can hear what God wants to say to us by listening to the themes of the Old Testament prophets. 
Remember, those prophets were speaking to very direct situations of their time, but the themes that they're bringing out still ring very valid, very effective and true in our own lives. And we're going to explore just two of them together, two of these themes that the prophets repeated over and over and over, and we need to hear God speaking. Now, maybe God speaking to you is an odd thing. You've never considered God speaking directly to you. Well, like I said, he wants to. Our God is alive. Our God is present. Our God has sent his Holy Spirit to talk to us. Now, it's often through reading and being challenged by what he says in the word, uh, his Bible. So let's start with the first one. I think it'll help us understand. The first theme that we're going to look at that the prophets repeat over and over is this big word, accusation. Accusation, of course, means accusing someone of something. And like I said, there were periods of Israel's history where they were really in the dumps. They were really far from God. They were really breaking all their promises to follow him. And God would send his prophets to tell them what they were doing wrong. Now, in our modern context, if you're accused of something, it's still a gray area. Well, maybe I'm not really, maybe that's not really true. That's not how it works in the Bible. When God's holy prophets showed up and accused Israel of something, They were totally correct every time, that Israel needed to hear these accusations of what they were doing wrong, the evil that they were committing in their lives. Now, the purpose of this wasn't for God just to be a jerk and send prophetic jerks to be mean and make everybody feel bad who was doing wrong. Instead, the goal of accusation was to say, listen, I'm your God. We're a family. Come back to me. This jolt of accusation was intended to turn God's people towards him so that they could be reconnected. Um, The only reason that worked is because God really kept his covenant promises to love them. They were a family. In fact, let me tell you a little bit about uh, my own family. I have two kids at home and my wife, and we have a lot of family rules. It turns out we're a big rule family, but we have one in particular that I'm a really big fan of. Here's the rule we have at our house. Always tell the truth. Do you have this rule at your house? You should try this one. It's real good. But <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> it seems like, oh, yeah, of course we're always going to tell the truth. Telling the truth to each other, even in a family, is very difficult. Because sometimes the truth is that you've messed up. Sometimes the truth is that you didn't tell the truth the previous time, and you've done something wrong. Now, what we've realized over the many years that we've tried to have uh, a good operating family is that this rule only makes sense with one other key component already in place, and that's this. It's coming. A solid foundation of love. Only if we truly are a committed family does telling the truth end up being in everyone's best interest. Because why would my kids tell me that they did something wrong if they don't trust that I'm going to love them and forgive them and take care of them and walk them through the consequences. There needs to be this solid root of, listen guys, we're together here. So yes, there may be consequences we need to walk through, but we are a family. We will love each other. That foundation of love, we've even been inspired by families who are a little bit ahead of us, older kids, who have literally said to their kids, listen, if you lie to me, And you tell me you're going to a friend's house, but you're really going to this big party at someone else's house, and you find yourself drunk at that party, which you have lied to me and said you wouldn't do, and you're there, and you are about to drive home, please don't drive home. Call me, and I will come and pick you up. And yes, we'll deal with the consequences, but listen, I would rather rescue you from that because I love you. And that kind of like real, like, in-the-trenches kind of love and truth-telling is so inspirational to me. Now, the reason why I tell you about that in what we're attempting in my family and what I've been inspired by others is because all of that resembles, is an echo of God's relationship with the people in his family. In ancient times, it was the people of Israel. Now it's anyone who chooses to follow Jesus. He is saying, listen, I accuse you, I want to tell you and bring accusation of what you've done wrong, but not just to be mean. I do that because, listen, we're a family. I want the best for you. I love you. And if you would turn to me, you would have more life than you have right now. God's accusation comes only in situations where we are rooted on his foundation of love. That's the situation in which God sent his prophets to the people of Israel in these ancient times. 
Often when they arrived, Israel was in a terrible spot doing terrible things, and they would use this phrase over and over. This is what the Lord says. The prophets didn't just make stuff up on their own. They were literally charged with speaking God's truth. And they used this phrase over and over in lots of different ways to kind of remind people, hey, I'm not just trying to be mean. God is telling you this thing. Now I want to read some of the accusation that God brought to Israel, some of the things he was accusing them of. And there are sub-themes, and I want you to look for, oh, are there repeated themes that come out of this? I think you'll be able to see some. So let me show you three different passages and look for some themes. Here's one in Ezekiel. Israel, God says, refused to keep my decrees and follow my regulations, even though obedience would have given them life. They scorned my decrees by violating the Sabbath days and longing for the idols of their ancestors. Here's another one from the prophet Jeremiah. He says, listen, admit that you rebelled against the Lord your God. You committed adulterily against him by worshiping idols under every green tree. Confess that you refused to listen to my vice. I, the Lord, have spoken. There's that phrase. The Lord says, I, the Lord, have spoken. Here's another uh, prophet Amos. He says, you twist justice, making it a bitter pill for the oppressed. You treat the righteous like dirt. How you hate honest judges how you despise people who tell the truth. You trample the poor. You steal their grain through taxes and unfair rent. You oppress good people by taking bribes and destri- deprive the poor of justice in the courts. So I think you can see that there were some things that they were doing that were really wrong. In fact, let me just list some of the themes we saw there. They were worshiping false idols. Uh, they were mistreating the poor and the powerless. They were perverting justice, and then finally, they were embracing corruption. These are the things that the people of Israel were guilty of. Do they seem pretty familiar? Does this remind you of the exact world that we live in currently that is doing all of these things? In fact, one of the authors I was reading this week summed it up in a really pointed way. Here's what he says. He says, the message is this. Society is rotten. People are suffering. God is angry. It's pretty dour hey, good news, why don't we read our Bibles? Ugh, society stinks, everything's... Now, honestly, though, very contemporary message. Some of you might be like, that's what I've been saying. The world is going down the toilet. I told you, the Bible agrees with me. If you're feeling that way, hey, listen, you're experiencing an echo of the old... You're close to understanding what the prophets of old were saying to God's people back then. And really, we could be saying right now, society is rotten. People are suffering. God is angry now. This is a very popular sentiment for religious people today. Yeah, the world stinks. The world is a bad place. But here is the major twist of the prophets. The accusation that the prophets bring would be very popular today. But our instinct when we feel like there's something rotten in the world, the world is not what it should be, Our instinct is to say, yeah, and it's their fault. It's all of those guys that I don't like that are making the world that way. And you know what we're going to do in order to overcome that? I am going to store up power. I am going to store up wealth. And I am going to protect me and my own as much as possible. Does that seem familiar to some of us? Where our idea of how to overcome the suffering and problems and grossness in society is to look out for me. Listen, the message of God in the prophets is literally the exact opposite of that response. God, when he comes to his people, says the world is a rotten place, but, he says, you are not the oppressed. He says, often, people of God, you are the oppressors. He says, I want you to read the prophets and read them as a charge that you need to take seriously. He he is calling it God's solution to the accusation that still exists in our society today is this very unpopular thing, repentance. And this is not those guys need to repent. This is we guys need to repent. This is God's people saying, have I fallen into the trap of self-protection, 
of trying to grow my own power, my own influence, my own wealth to protect me and my people from the grossness in the world. God is saying, listen, I'm a God that does just the opposite. I will send my son, Jesus, the king of kings, and he will not protect himself. He will sacrifice his own life to show true friendship to you. He will make himself so low, so unprotected, he would literally die for you in order to show the character of God. This instinct we have to self-protection needs to be met by what God is challenging us through in the prophets, which is repentance. A complete 180 for that. An internal looking and saying, where have I been part of this process of building up walls rather than reaching out to help in a situation that's rotten. In fact, there, there's a very famous repentance-based challenge from uh, the book of Micah, one of the most famous uh, verses in the Bible. Here is Micah the prophet's word from God to us still today. He says this. He says, people, the Lord has told you what's good. This is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Not self-protection, not growing influence and power so I can crush my enemy. Humility, right living, humbly walking with God and showing mercy to others. In fact, here I want to word it as a contemporary challenge for us. Here's what it is for this next week. Run every inclination through Micah 6, 8. Anything that you are inclined to do, run it through. Am I doing what is right? Does it show others mercy? Am I being humble before God? Am I growing in his humility? There is a lot. That means if you go to work tomorrow and that guy who's on your work team is messing up again, he's late for his deadlines, he is taking this project, what should you do? Should you crush him? No. You should do what is right. You should show mercy as you're able. You should walk humbly before God and the places that he has put you. If something is happening in your family and you're bugged by a relative, should you shut them out? You should probably do what is right and show them mercy and walk humbly with God. This is a very challenging uh, uh, thing that the prophets want to teach us, that God wanted to say to his people, which is you, which is me, I need to make this turn in my life. In fact, I want to end, you guys, as I've been reading through the prophets in preparation for this. There are many of these themes, but I could not escape one theme that I want to bring back in front of you as an application point this week. One thing that we deal with sometimes, but I feel like God wants us to take it very seriously. There is one application point that he keeps telling ancient Israel that would turn the tide in their lives if they would make this change and really make it. Here's what it is. They should care for the poor. In the prophets, God does not use this symbolically. He's not saying metaphorically. He is saying literally. The growing wealth and protection is not the solution. The sharing and care for people who are less privileged than ourselves would show us as God's people. Uh, This is something that's both corporate, that of course I know that these are big, giant, systemic issues, and we have not as a society figured out the solutions at that level, but there is a personal challenge here of what should I be doing to honor God in these areas? Here's what God, again, unmetaphorically says to his people, here's what we should do. He says, share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And don't hide from relatives who need your help. <laughs> I like that one because it's like, okay, great. I'm ha- yeah, we'll help the poor. Oh, crud. My relatives need me and I don't want to talk to my aunt anymore. Sorry. God is calling us to that. Now, by the way, we have a commitment as a church to these type of values. 
Uh, we, we, as a church, have made decisions that shape the way we do things in order to try to impact or bring life to people who need it that are, that are not getting those things. So that usually comes out most effectively in our local outreach uh, things. We have a, we have a huge connection uh, with DCFS in L.A. County where we are focused on supporting the, the kids in foster care and families that are helping raise them, and especially as kids age out of the foster care system, we know that is a very vulnerable time in our world, and we have committed together to care and resource and help people in those situations. Uh, that's also why we do Feed My Starving Children, because we know that there's globally a food crisis, and we can make a difference by going big, once a year at least, in big efforts to feed those around the world that are, that are food deficient, that don't have those opportunities to get it themselves. Um, we, we have countless opportunities, and actually you'll see as the fall ramps up in September and October, we'll have several of these that come up in the announcements or the e-news about, I mean, we're, we're having like a beach cleanup day to honor the community. We're having a really needed uh, blood drive that'll take place at the Torrance campus. We'll have even more events and a stronger connection with DCFS and the foster care system, not to solve every problem, but to do what we can together at our scale to help people in need, but that's not really what the prophets are talking about talking about. Instead, I want to give you this challenge uh, that I think is trying to word it. You should sign up for outreach at church soon, but start caring now. The South Bay is the oddest place in the world because we have the filthiest rich and we have the utter destitute sitting next to each other at church. If you don't think that there is need in our community, first of all, wake up. <laughs> and second of all, they might be sitting next to you. And that's good. I'm so glad that our church has that beautiful diversity, but we are also statistically the oppressors. I can speak with God's truth to say statistically, we are not the oppressed. There may be some of us who are really struggling and truly would be the poor or the oppressed. The rest of us are giants of wealth. And I, don't, I mean, that's, I know that that's different levels. For, let me give you some examples so you know what I'm talking about. You can make a difference this week. My, my kid has signed up for a marching band. They just started rehearsal. He's a trombone player. Really funny. I think marching band is like the funniest thing. It's great too. But he, he's in marching band. And then they're like, yay, marching band is so great. Your kid's going to get so much out of it. And then they send the email with the fee. <laughs> like here's how much, $500 is what it costs. Now, I don't know if you're like me. You get an email saying, hey, you got to pay $500 for your kid to do something. And I'm like, What? That's so expensive. But listen, $500 is infinity to someone in our community who's truly struggling financially. It's a real burden for me, but it's nothing like what it is for people who are truly struggling. Maybe you're there. Your kids are in sports. You're getting those same horrible emails that I'm getting. I think there are some of us who need to hear that this year you should pay $600. And let that $100, if your school makes it possible, let that $100 offset a real, true challenge that a family is having. That They're, they're like, hey, we can't do marching band this year. That, there's practical ways that we can be of assistance. Uh, the other thing is we are uniquely, maybe not unique completely, but very odd. In We have a world where we see uh, a challenge with unhoused people in our community, don't we? You may, on the way home, Walk by someone who's unhoused. And listen, again, these are systemic problems. I, we cannot solve everything. But those are people. We need, because God challenged, we need to care for the poor. And that doesn't mean solving their problems. That doesn't mean feel bad. That means care. That means show them humanity. Honor them as people. That might mean, if it's safe to do, and you're walking by, making eye contact. Saying hello. Hello. If you're walking at McDonald's to buy one cheeseburger, buy two cheeseburgers and share one with that person. Sit and eat with them. Spend 25 minutes, hear their story. Ask them what their next step is, what their thoughts are in, in, their, in their hard situation. Show, now listen, if they don't want your cheeseburger and they refuse it, that is an amazing opportunity to honor the fact that humans get to choose what food they want. And it's not like, oh, that ungrateful person. That's like, oh, you're a human being. I get it. I don't want to eat food I don't want to eat. There is a chance we have to care, not solve every problem, but to care 
in a way that we never have before. It starts not with church, not with more churchy stuff. It starts with individuals who are called by God to turn their lives around, make room where we never would have before uh, for people in need. We need to start caring now. Hey, in just a second, we're going to uh, sing a song together. And actually, this is the time where the bands, both at Torrance and Manhattan Beach, are going to start loading. Let me just close by saying this. It, it, could we help people with the wrong motives? Could we be sour about it and still go through the actions? Yeah, that's always a possibility. Still do it. I think the message of the prophets is like, hey, start with the action. God will deal with our hearts in the process, but let's not, I would ra- God would rather that we serve people with bad motives than not serve people, <laughs> at least at the beginning. So let, let's let him work on us. We need to hear from God. And today what he's saying to us from his ancient prophets thousands of years ago is do what's right, show mercy, walk humbly with God, and we'll see a difference. It would have made a difference back then. It'll make a difference in our world today. Um, We're going to close with singing a a famous old hymn, uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness, where we celebrate God's unending love that despite all the mistakes we make that we need to be uh, hear accusation about, turn our ways, God doesn't. He is always faithful. So both here and at Manhattan Beach, will you stand with me? We're just going to close in prayer, and then we'll sing together. All right, let me pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for what you have planned. Thank you that some of us needed to hear today from your prophets. I needed to hear this week from your prophets that, that my heart needs to care more than it does that I needed to turn to you uh, and not run away or protect myself, but instead, Lord God, be willing and vulnerable to sacrifice like you did. Jesus, lead us into new places, new life uh, found in helping people, helping each other. Thank you for this place where we can do that together. Jesus, you are wonderful to us, faithful to us. We celebrate you, and we pray all these things in your name, Jesus.